Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you had a good lunch. Welcome back to uh, our first afternoon session. Um, I've had the pleasure uh, to introduce uh, our, one of our speakers for the past three years. He has a, a unique view on the digital world that we all live in, work in, play in. Um, and today he's going to be talking about disruptive innovation, which to me just has a tiny hint of oxymoron about it, but we shall see. Um, normally he's on his own, but today he has um, uh, Andrew Jacobs, who's Learning and Development Manager for uh, the London Borough of Lambeth. And they are going, they're going to be doing a, uh, a dialogue, perhaps, certainly an interaction. Um, I hope it's going to be clean with no, no uh, underhand punches. But um, please welcome uh, Steve Wheeler and Andrew Jacobs. Thanks, Juan. I'm going to start off. Uh, good afternoon. It's nice to see you all here. Um, this is something slightly different. Uh, Vaughan says it's a dialogue. Actually, it's a trialogue uh, because I want to engage with you and so does Andrew. And, and so we'll, we'll probably bounce a few ideas and arguments off each other, but we, we'd like you to join in as well. And hence, we have at least one microphone, maybe two in the audience here, um, one at the back as well over there. I see that hand. I feel like Billy Graham. Only once, to, yeah. And, and um, so, so really, it's, um, it's a case of let's get a dialogue going about this and, and let's see what we can come up with in terms of um, a lack of agreement, lack of consensus, maybe, you know, some, some arguments and some, um, yeah, maybe, I don't know, I, I wouldn't go as far as fist shaking, but uh, let, let's see what happens. So I'm going to start off with this slide. This is Malcolm Cooper and the brick. Anyone remember this? Where are you going? Well, anybody else hmm? seems to know who you are, so I'm going to sit with them and... I'll see so. Are you that, in are you that interesting? See what I've got to work with. Anyway, <coughs> he, he, he's going to sit down. I don't, but Malcolm Cooper and, and the brick, right? Now, at the time, this was the first mobile phone. It was all battery, basically, and nobody thought too much of it. Uh, but um, let's just take a straw poll here. Can you stand up if you've got a mobile phone on you? Okay. This is one way of getting you exercise. You're standing up as well, Vaughan. Um, right. Um, now, stay standing up if you've got more than one mobile phone on you. Now, isn't that interesting? So there's, there's at least, what, 30 people in the room who have got more than one mobile phone. Sit down if you've actually got more than two on you. Ah, so this, uh, see, this is interesting, isn't it? So there's people here with more than two mobile phones. I won't ask them what they do with them all, because that could be rather embarrassing, but thank you very much. So that's just an illustration of, of suddenly how ubiquitous something becomes. It, it's basically um, an innovation that has disrupted what we do. Who can actually remember going into a, a phone box and actually using a phone? <laughs> yeah, Who, who's done that in the last year? Anyone? One, two, three, three, not many. Um, 10, 15 years ago, there would have been a lot more hands. And 50 years ago, probably everyone would have put their hands up. So you can see how, how uh, technology innovations actually change forever the way we, things do, we, we do things. Um, here's another innovation. Um, this is, um, I don't know if you've seen this or even used one of these, but it's not one that actually innovated too much. It didn't take off. It wasn't disruptive. It didn't change forever the way we do things. This is called the Lou Reed, by the way. All right? And, um, it, it, you know, I show that because there are some innovations that just don't take off. And, and one of the first questions we're going to ask is, is um, you know, why don't some innovations take off when others do? Why do some disrupt and, and some not disrupt? And, oh, here he comes. He's going to come up on stage now. What are you going to say about that, then? What disrupts and what doesn't disrupt? What disrupts and what doesn't disrupt? Um, well, yeah, go on, then. Okay. He's going to take control now. Uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> okay. Oops. Boom. Is, is this toilet humor? It's tied to learning. Um, how many people here work in a learning and development function as a lead for learning and development in some form, yeah? Okay. Who owns the learning in your organization, you or the people who you work with? Oops. Organizationally owned, personally supported. As opposed to personally owned, organizationally supported. What prompts innovation is when an individual owns it themselves. When it's owned by an external, by another organization or elsewhere, the person hasn't got an attachment to it, they're not going to want to be involved. 
So you're saying that personalization is the, 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 the yardstick for widespread adoption, are you? It's one element of it. What else? I mean, I mean you know, yeah, okay, look at this. <laughs> Has anyone got one of these? <laughs> um, it's, it's one of these dodgy ones, isn't it? It's, uh, I, I mean, this is an innovation. Someone's actually designed this. That's personal. So where's your argument there? Is it safe? Well, it's not safe, is it? Of course it's not, <laughs> unless you're parked. Um, so what's your point then? All right, okay. Ask a question about mobile phones. What is valuable and what isn't valuable? How many of the people who attended that concert there are then going to go and buy the DVD? Why should they? Because they've already got a DVD of the concert on their phone. They have a video, they have the sound, they have the personal experience and the content to be able to add to it. Why should any of those people go out and buy the DVD? They already have ownership by the experience of having been there. I don't agree with that because um, I think if I was at a conference, a concert like that, should I say, and it was one of my favorite bands, um, and I'd taken some video footage of it, I'd still want to buy the DVD because, because of the added value that's, that the manufacturer puts into it, you know, the making of video and the, the backstage interviews, which you don't get access to. The extras? The extras, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how much more should you pay for them? I, th I think um, the market will sustain what people will pay for it. I mean, okay. that, that, that the market creates itself, doesn't it? Okay. So anybody who works in organizational learning and development, does the market sustain itself? Within your organizations, does your market sustain itself? Are you the providers for your market, or does the market come to you? <coughs> Happy to have a conversation on this. I think there's two answers to that, isn't there? It depends on whether you're um, internally l and or whether it's external stuff that you're also connecting with, isn't it? I don't know. What do the audience here think? Who, who actually um, does external stuff? So, some of you, yeah, not many. That's interesting. I, I thought there'd be more than that. Um, what, what kind of stuff, we need a microphone perhaps here, what kind of stuff, you, you've singled yourself out now by putting your hand up. <laughs> That's okay, as long as you're happy with that. So what kind of stuff do you do and what are the issues with it? Well, externally, we, uh, we, we are involved in pitching for bids for client e-learning yeah. on a range of subjects. So for there, you know, we are providing a market service and they come and say, <laughs> what can you do to help us? We've got this client proposal. But in the same way, uh, I need to actually personally spend more time promoting, evangelizing what we've got in-house for our internal people. And I think it's something we don't do well enough. So, so, yeah. so kind of both, you know, we know what our market, or we think we know what our market needs, but then they will come to us and say, actually, we need this as well. So the idea behind that is you're outward facing, essentially, and you're connecting outwardly rather than just inwardly. And, and I think that's what I'm trying to get at, Andrew. So it's not just about um, internal markets, it's external markets, it's also about added value, it's, it's about personalization, sure, yeah. but there's not a lot more to it than that, I think. Absolutely, it's not just, and we'll agree on that point, it is that extra added value. My concern is, is, is that what we do is we say to people, all right, you've attended this concert, nobody can film it, nobody can record it, you have to buy the DVD, and we do that in learning and development. You have to go on the course. I think what you're saying there is that exclusivity is dead. Is that, is that true though? Does anyone subscribe to that? Some of you do, some of you don't. What do you mean by exclusivity? Well, you know, the, you, this, this is the only product, we've got it, we're gonna sell it to you for the price we wanna sell it for, um, and, and you've gotta cope with it or, or not have the product. So where does compliance come into that? Compliance is a good question. Yeah. Where does compliance come into that? There, there is a certain amount of compliance training that is essential and necessary. How do, we, how do we manage that? How do we make it attractive? I think is a, is a big question, isn't it? How do we actually, <laughs> what was the story we heard earlier on about somebody downstairs, a vendor, who, who um, wanted to talk about how to make compliance training attractive, and their first slide was about 12 bullet points. <laughs> so that was a little bit ironic, you know, but, uh, you know. So, so I, I, you know, does anyone have the answer to that? Is anyone coming up with a really whiz-bang idea about how to make compliance training sexy and attractive? Back, back to, let's bring the microphone to, uh, to, to um, this lady again here. Uh, I don't know about sexy and attractive, but actually it, it um, is awarded two points. I know this is going to sound terribly sexy. Two points of continuing professional development. Uh, so in other words, it, it allows them to continue practicing as solicitors. And that's quite a big carrot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's an interesting point. But there, there are also other ways of doing this. Has anyone uh, tried gamifying? Is that something you're familiar with? 
Yeah, we've done, we've done it. You, you've done it? Yeah. Um, gamifying is not about games playing. It's about the rules of the games being imposed or, or applied. So that, um, in effect, um, your learners are actually gaining points or, or, or um, solving problems and, and uh, coming up with an alternative, or whatever it is it, that the game does for you, it does the same. And, and one of the most important and powerful things about this, this is why it's so innovative and so disruptive, is that you learn through failure. And we never celebrate failure in this culture. That's a big problem. We never celebrate it because it seemed to be a bad thing. But we fail all the time. And I think the problem is, if we don't learn from that failure, then there's a big problem. But if we do learn from it, then surely we should, should try and celebrate that and move on from it. And gamification has that element in it, which I think is really powerful. What do you want to say about that? Playing. Playing. Is it really? Playing instead of working. No, no, I, I, I disagree. Um, okay, I so, so I was in a meeting yesterday afternoon. We just launched Yammer within our organisation. Very slow, soft launch. Um, mm. And a senior manager said to me, I had a look on Yammer and people were talking about the cinema. How do we stop that? <laughs> and my... <laughs> Why is it harmful to talk about the cinema? Let's say, say that again in the microphone. Why is it uh, harmful to talk about cinema while you're learning? I mean, I, I think I'm picking up the thread again from the exclusivity that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Uh, I believe there's been a linearity in how we learn, mm. but the world outside where we actually go and apply our skills is not so linear. So why can't we yeah. have much more I, I don't so why not games yeah. in other yeah. I don't. I don't necessarily disagree. Uh, I said the same thing to the manager. Why should we stop talking about the cinema? Because I don't think it's a bad thing. In terms of shared experience, everybody who's at that concert is sharing that experience. Everybody has the same context to be able to understand it. What people have is different perspectives. So somebody on this side of the, the auditorium compared to someone on the other side of the auditorium will experience different things in terms of the people they have around them as well. So from that argument, I think we should be doing it. I don't disagree. So hang on one second. Let's, let's just wait for the microphone to get to you. So we can get this on the, um, the video as well. I'm going to be a bit of a devil's advocate here because Go Yammer on. is one of those really good examples where it's fine to talk about the cinema, but if somebody's got X number of hours in their day and they're spending a large proportion of those talking about stuff that is not anywhere related to what they're doing in their, in their day, then it, be, it becomes not just a disruptive technology, it becomes a completely disruptive technology. So I think there's a difference between a social networking site and being able to use that successfully, as well as using a networking site to be able to facilitate sharing of information within an organisation. See, the problem you've got there is that bosses want to quantify everything. They want <coughs> return on investment. They want to show that the time spent by their employees is actually being pro you know, productive. And they can't really measure social learning in, to that extent. Would you agree? Um, there's a lot of things that go on in, on a social network and on a social media platform where learning takes place, but it's very informal and it's, it's, not, it's easy, not easy to, call to quantify. Yeah? And uh, there's a brilliant example of it on the screen here. This was in October of this year. Um, very similar to what Steve's done. I asked the audience who here has a smartphone and I got them all to take photos. And effectively all those people have now have a social connection. Now, is it wrong that they have that connection? Are we saying that it can't be some value that people have for that conversation? The problem is, I, I'm, I'm gonna agree with Steve here, which is very <laughs> rare. <laughs> we count in the wrong things. We count the inputs, we don't count the outcomes. We worry about how much time somebody spends on something rather than the quality of the work that comes from it. What was interesting was the Yammer conversation yesterday was, yeah, there was somebody talking about cinema Underneath it, somebody posted a question saying, I really want to bring on our corporate onboarding and induction. Who can help me do it? And 12 people had answered. And had all supplied really valuable, interesting, suitable stuff. So where's the balance? Here's another problem I want to put to you. I mean, not only um, are we talking about disruptive innovation being something, I like to describe it as a, as a black hole with an event horizon. You, you go across that event horizon, you adopt the technology, and you never, ever go back to what you were doing before because you've got the new device and it allows you to do stuff like the mobile phone or the web, which you never could do before. 
And suddenly your, your life, your work, your entertainment, your relationships are transformed. It's a different thing that you never want to go back to. But here's a blocker. Here, here's a problem. Um, these are two scenes from the film Metropolis. I'm sure you recognize them. And um, this is technophobia. Fear of technology. Fear of um, something changing your life which you've got no control over. I think that's the essence of technophobia. And I, I just want to ask a question here from all of you. How many of you, put your hand up if you've actually shouted at your computer. That's quite a forest of hands of people who have shouted at their computer. Uh, put your hands up if you have ever had a moment of panic when you've thought that the computer has swallowed your files and they're really important and you've worked for hours on them and you can't get them back. Put your hand up. Even more. Um, these, according to Mark Brosnan, who is a psychologist, are elements, very mild elements, of technophobia. In other words, you know, I will or I won't use the technology. And this is one of the digital divides that we talk about, the idea that there are not just the haves and have-nots, which is a socioeconomic divide, there's also the, the cans and cannots, which is a skills divide, and there's also the, the will and will-nots, which is, I, I think, a psychological, a technophobic divide, and every organization has these elements within it. There's another group, if you've got one. The shoulds and should nots. Are there people in your organizations who you wouldn't trust to handle your organizational Twitter account? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just asking the question. Are there people who we shouldn't be encouraging to learn or work socially <coughs> online? Um, I work for a council. You know, we provide hundreds and hundreds of services, but including those of some within social care. There are going to be people who are you know, potentially very vulnerable, should we be allowing those people and freeing them up and giving them access to this technology? Well, that, that, that's rather um, excluding, isn't it? I mean, if people are people. Um, surely we all have the right to, to have access to the web? What's, what's going on over here? Hi. Um, just to answer that point, I mean... Imagine we didn't have any technology. Would you stop those people speaking? So we're just doing the same as we've always done in a different way. That's all. So, I agree. I agree. You know, I, I it, it will I, find its own balance, I believe. It's been very prejudicial, I think, to actually say that some people should not use social media or technology in an organisation. So let's go back to the question I asked before then. There's some people you wouldn't trust to use your Twitter. Does everybody allow everybody in their organisation to run their organisation Twitter account? Why not? Sorry. Hang on. Let me bring the mic down. We're, this is on video, apparently. So. <laughs> We're in a, a large awarding organisation, qualification awarding organisation, and we have a specific um, voice, a specific brand, a specific message for students and for members all around the world. And the, the Twitter community is very lively amongst people who are subscribing it, our users. But from our outgoing Twitter, it's carefully controlled or managed to make sure that we are continuing, as it were, on brand. So there's not, yeah. a, there's not a restriction on people using it, the users who are yeah. having conversations amongst themselves. But there is a restriction on what we're using Twitter for organisationally as one of our output channels. I think that's for good reason, because that's a defined role within an organization, to be the social media manager, isn't it? Where you are actually the public face for a potentially global audience of the message that the organization is trying to put out. That's a different thing to actually letting anyone tweet, Andrew. Okay, so you have a all right, so social media manager who defines exactly what can and can't be said. Why do we have learning and development managers who define what people can and can't learn? Different, bigger question. So, a uh, hand up over here. So it's a question. Um, what about people who, and I kind of do this as well, um, people who put, I, um, I do this job at this company, but my views don't represent this company. What like, how, what, what's going on there? The, like, kind, the kind of these views are my own and not my Yeah, own. basically, yeah. you know, they're defining themselves by that particular role, but anything I say, if I swear when I'm drunk, then that doesn't count, and you, sh you shouldn't <laughs> like, hold my company liable for that. Isn't, isn't that why people like you, Doug, have two different accounts? <laughs> <laughs> Hands up who's got more than one Twitter account. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess it, it's about being accountable, isn't it? And, uh, but there's, there's several layers of accountability here that we need to kind of tear to pieces and analyze. You know, the, the level of accountability where it's you 
tweeting your own personal stuff under your own name, but then there's other stuff which you might do under a pseudonym. Then there's stuff that you do officially for an organization. Then there might be other stuff you do for a political party or I don't know, you know. So I, I think it's much more complex than you're okay. making it out to be. Can we get the microphone over? Thanks. Uh, does this whole argument not kind of boil down to, I suppose, stripping away the channel and looking at it as common sense? So just because there's a barrier of being online doesn't mean that you should behave any differently to how you would in real life. I think the whole thing is that people perceive it as a channel and a bit of a disguise that you can hide behind, whereas yeah. you, you wouldn't kind of go out and behave in a way that will bring your company into disrepute in real life, so why, why would you do that online? And I think that's kind of the culture shift that we need to try and drive. And that's exactly why there have been so many media stories of people who've done just that. I mean, I'm talking about sports people, for instance, or pop stars, who um, do behave differently, unfortunately, online than they do in real life. And the reason for that is, is well, the psychological explanation I can give you as a psychologist is that they are being, um, their behavior is being disinhibited by the medium they're using. There's also an element of anonymity. It's a bit like driving in your car and giving someone the finger because they've cut you up. You wouldn't do that face to face with them, but because you're in a car, you think that you can get away with it because you're in an enclosed space which is different to their enclosed space. And there's a divorceness going on. All right, that's, that's kind of my kind of view. I don't know what you think about that, Andrew. Um, I think the issue around the should, should not, I would agree to a point is do people feel protected? Um, and the issue is really is that do we try and add a sense of vulnerability? As people become more confident in using technology, I think we will find more of those examples where people are giving other people the finger. Because those rules, those normalized rules, have not necessarily been defined as yet. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right there. I, I think I, I would agree that there are emerging social mores and, and emerging social conventions that it's a bit like what Brian Solis was saying this morning about um, society and culture trying to catch up with technology. We haven't quite got there yet to understand the full impact of what we're doing and, and the roles that we play within our interactions with each other using these media. So I think if you extrapolate that to a whole organization, then you can see the interplay and then you can see the issues and challenges. And that's really what we're trying to get at. Here's examples of impact. What have we got? Oh, yeah, right, okay. So. <laughs> Here's a question for you. What do these two companies have in common? They went bust. Well, Blockbuster's still going, isn't it? But only just. Kodak's still going, but in a different way. So, so what is it apart from going bust that, that kind of joins those two companies together? Technology? Sorry? Irrelevance. Ah, an interesting uh, statement. Irrelevance. Um, for me, I, I think I, that resonates with me because um, Blockbuster, maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, or even 20 years ago when they were, when they were peddling VHS um, cassettes and later on DVDs, um, that was at the point where um, it there was a scarcity. It, it was expensive. You, you could buy them, but it would cost you a lot more money. So you would go and hire them instead. Um, Kodak was a different irrelevancy, I think. They, they just didn't keep up with the trends. Um, when the digital camera came out, they, they tried to ignore it. Um, they, they tried to um, carry on, on on the furrow that they were plowing, and of course it came back to bite them, mixing my metaphors there. But that's exactly what happened, I think. And the, both those companies are going under, largely. Would you agree? So I think, it's, I think it is about irrelevance. Um, what else might there be that links those two companies together? They didn't follow the market. They didn't understand the market, perhaps. Okay, so, I mean, th these give us indicators of, of why um, other technologies and other companies have come along and replaced them with better products, which they do understand the market with. So, yeah. Can, um, I, can, can I say something? Because I was going to say something about the, yeah. well, the Twitter and perhaps about that. Yeah. Um, I've got two Twitter accounts, but that's because I have them for two separate things, but in terms of my main Twitter account, which is Songbird, everybody, um, I, had a dis I had a period at the beginning where I s was tweeting a lot about learning and development stuff, and I thought it was very, very um, confining for me as a person just to be stuck with 
what happens within my organisation, but obviously I don't want to bring my organisation into disrepute. So other than having a third one, which is just wonderful, I thought at one point, you know, to hell with it, this is me, and um, I, I'll, I'll say what I would say normally, you know, and sometimes that can be a bit on the edge and sometimes it's fine. Sometimes it's about L&D and sometimes it's not. But I do think that in terms of having fragmented profiles at some point, especially with the way we're going, that we're all going to be able, to, we're all going to be sucked into one anyway. So I don't know if you're going to be able to say, well, I've got this persona at work. I mean, that's partly to do with the traditional model of how organisations have been, where we kind of go to work with our game face and then we go home and let it all hang out. But the lines are all blurring, aren't they? So I think there is definitely um, disruption, not just of the technology, but of the society and what that technology engenders. What, what you've got is, is not just technology disrupting things uh, and people disrupting things, but things like words as well disrupting our society. Um, if you press me later on, I'll give you some examples of what I've thought of as, as, as these disruptive elements. But they are components, all, all components of the same uh, movement or, or, or tsunami, if you like, of, of change that's going on in the society. And they're all disruptive in different ways. I don't perhaps think with Blockbuster and Kodak, it might have been not necessarily, not necessarily that they didn't understand the markets, but they didn't know how to change themselves in uh, response to the market. You can get together afterwards and really discuss this. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. What you've got here is, the, effectively, this is two, two models. You've got Kubler-Ross, the typical you know, grief model, um, and you've also got, the name's gone from my Rogers. head. Rogers. Um, diffusion of innovation. Now, what happened was is Netflix came along and Love Film came along and Blockbuster disappeared, yeah? Because they found a way of disrupting innovation. They found a way of disrupting an innovating activity in order to be able to move things along. Now, what Rogers has said is that there's five stages through that innovation for a, an innovation to be diffused and across these five stages. First of all, you have to know it. You then persuade people. You make a decision as to what you're going to innovate with. You implement it, and it's then confirmed, and it's in place, and it becomes the norm. What I thought was interesting is if you overlay that with Kubler-Ross, you can see the problems we have with innovating in organisations. So I say to you, we're going to innovate and do something new. The first thing people go is, well, that won't work. And they will use one of these four things. And these are prevalent throughout learning and development. People will say that things won't innovate because we can't do something new because we have training rooms. Those are physical factors. We have to fill them. We have to demonstrate the use of the space. We spent a lot of money on that technology in those rooms. So we have to fill them. Second factor that stops people is temporal. We've never done that that way before, so we can't do that now. And we find excuses not to do it. And we rely on best practice. Best practice doesn't exist. There's no such thing as best practice. All you have is accepted practice. It can't be best practice, because if it was best, it would constantly be innovated. Third factor that stops us is lateral. And by lateral, we look around and go, is anybody else doing it? Because if nobody else is doing it, do I want to stick my head above the parapet and come up with something new? Well, hang on, hang on a sec. Um, lots of successful companies have actually done just that and gone ahead when everyone else has stayed behind. How do you explain that? OK, organisations may do that. I'm talking specifically around learning and development interventions. How many learning and development people sit and work with our learning and development people from other organisations to say, what are you doing that's new, interesting and wonderful that I can do? And you get some pockets of it, but there's still this, and this goes back to the, the social media thing and not wanting to overshare stuff, that commercial sensitivity with sharing the things that we're doing. The fourth one is hierarchical. That's a hierarchical factor. This is from Clayton Christensen. He put this in there. A book called Disrupting Class. Highly recommended. And he says there's hierarchical factors. So, who says what good learning looks like? Is it higher education? Is it further education? Is it the LPI? Is it the CIPD? Who defines what good learning is? And all of those people have an opinion. If you're trying to bring an, in, uh, an innovation in, you have to take those into account because people can go, they're not going to work. And then they're going to get angry. And your job when you're trying to bring an innovation in then is to say, OK, well, this will work because you haven't got to be angry. It's going to be fine. It's all going to work well. And you then get into a period of phase of bargaining. And what happens is we then start diluting down the thing we want to innovate. So that really wonderful idea that we had of no courses, classrooms, or workshops, people want to dilute down. 
I say no courses, classrooms or workshops because I have no courses, classrooms or workshops. I've pulled them from my entire calendar. <coughs> there are none in my calendar at all. I've got a solution for this, I think. Let's, on, just, let's just try this out. Um, in every organisation, there's always someone somewhere who's doing things differently. Yeah? Um, maybe even against the rules. Certainly they're doing things slightly differently to everyone else. Maybe they're a maverick. Um, some people would call them a positive deviant. Come across this term? Find that person and learn from them. If you're interested in innovation, find that person, seek them out and learn from them. Might be you. Maybe you're the positive deviant. Are you a positive deviant, Andrew? <coughs> I'm positively deviant. <laughs> <laughs> he's do you know he's wearing boxing glove cuffs? Do you know that? Um, I, I, he said he was going to wear these, and I, I thought he's going to get his wrist pierced. That's what he's going to do. Yeah. <laughs> but no, he didn't. It, it, it's, it's, he'll show them afterwards for you, if you like. Now, there. he's stolen my clicker, but I've got another one. Oh, here. Hey on. this, this works as well. Is that working? Now, I know he was involved in this. You know, you know what this is? This, this is the C5, isn't it? C5, is it? Yeah. Okay, it's a Sinclair. Um, it was the first electric car. Um, it failed. It's a really good idea, actually. So it was an innovation but it wasn't disruptive. Why was that? I mean, you, you were involved in the launch yeah. of this, weren't you? Yeah. Why did it fail? Yeah. Um, wrong time. Wrong time. So that was a, a, a temporal issue. Entirely a temporal factor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Part of the reason was is that it was launched in um, the winter. And so all the press went along to the launch and were sat in uncovered Sinclair C5s in sleet and snow. <laughs> I kid you not driving along private roads, going, isn't this cold? I'm getting wet. What favourable press are you going to get from that? It's temporal, so in those terms, when it was launched, it was also in terms of uh, the point it was. This was 85, 84, 83, there or thereabouts, I can't remember exactly. Um, now, electric vehicles are commonplace. Battery technology has moved on. But, um, I mean, isn't there an so another Steve, element here, though? Steve, Andrew? sorry, have well, a... What have we got down here, sorry? We have a question. I'm just going to add something, because... For me, I've experienced something, and I'm trying to put it into a, a bucket that you've explained, and I'm not sure it fits. So um, I um, moved into learning and development about three years ago and did the whole kind of immerse myself in new technologies, what's yeah. happening. And, and what I really found was a real difference between people who have got great technology and people who know how to apply learning, and actually that mix. So I, I actually came from a supply HR background and used to production sites, manufacturing facilities, and actually went back into my organization and said, you know, there's nobody doing this around mobile learning in teach, teaching operators how to use machines, to root cause analysis, changeovers and things, using these 3D kind of apps. And even the organization we worked with, it was new, and in the organization that I worked for in Viaggio, it was a kind of a, well, is that going to work? There was a lot of that kind of temporal piece. <coughs> but actually the real barrier was actually just taking some of the technology we have and actually knowing how to apply it properly. And I really think that in this whole technology age, there's a real risk that we get locked up in the technology again and forget what yeah. the core kind of learning piece behind that is. So we get gamification and all these nice apps and things that are really exciting. And we actually lose the whole prospect of what we're trying to get to, which is the application. And mm. I just think going through what you were talking about there is you can have the knowledge about what you want to do and you can have the kind of the right technology. But I still think we've got some way to kind of change our learning methods to meet to, to be able to make that. <coughs> That's a really good point. And, and I'll just elaborate on that by telling you about my, the school's experience. I, I train a lot of teachers and I get to go into lots of schools. And occasionally I see, you know, really, really shiny, expensive equipment and it's lying around doing nothing. Or worse, it's being used wrongly or badly. I'll give you an example. The interactive whiteboard, when it was introduced into schools, what did teachers do with it generally? They used it exactly the same way as they would use a standard whiteboard. <coughs> Firstly, they couldn't see the possibilities. Secondly, they weren't aware of, you know, they, sorry, they weren't aware of what they, they, they could do with it. Secondly, they weren't trained uh, sufficiently. And thirdly, it was bought to solve a problem which they didn't know about, they weren't aware of. So, so in effect, they bought the technology and then tried to find the problem to solve it with. And I think that's what you're referring to, isn't it? It is, and even when we were trying to do this kind of pilot, there was, I had to really push the organisation because what we were going to end up with was awesome, al almost an, um, 
an online best operating practice manual mm. with a few video clips in it. And it, it was what people knew, but, but you know, I, we, we did go to kind of full kind of 3D animation of machinery and things, which, which was really where the value was and yeah. just shifting that forward. But I, th I think that that's an interesting point. I think we do that a lot in learning development as well. We find solutions and then we go, okay, I've got a solution. What's the problem I can apply it to? And technology is massive around that. I'm coming from a situation and circumstance experience where my team has gone from eight people to two people, and I'm one of them. So I have a team of two and I'm one. I'm, I'm working off of Internet Explorer 8, is the platform that I work through. So give me a technology that will work off of that. So <laughs> it's, it's the way you're positioning it. If you're linking technology first, you're always going to struggle. Yeah, I have a point on the, the interactive smart boards. I brought in a, a, two electronic smart boards into a corporate law firm about eight years ago. And one of the issues we had is that the salespeople, in fact, the salesman came along and started kicking it. He said, this is very robust, as if he was you know, talking to school children. I said, look, this isn't a problem that we have you know, with the lawyers kicking the balls. And actually, they didn't have any possible advice about the application of this technology mm. in a corporate world. Mm. Mm. Zero. Mm. And that was an issue that we had. So exactly the situation, potentially, mm. it would be good, but there was just no experience of people applying so it. So what you have there is you've got a lateral factor. Who else is using interactive whiteboards on a corporate level? Who is actually using them? How are they using them? Is there some value in it? And we can't see it, so we'll just... We don't know what we're going to use them for. It never ceases to amaze me the amount of um, similarities there are between the corporate sector and, and different education sectors in terms of the challenges and the problems. And, and that's clearly one of them. And there are, there are loads of others. I, you, you can think of them yourself. But, you know, really, we're, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. We're just in different sectors. And that's, that's the point of this. Over to you, Anu. Um, yeah, I was just um, curious. Going back to the idea of where we're you know, using technology for what it's for and so on. Um, I wonder if they had a, a training course on how to blow up a Death Star. Oh, sorry, it's just... So why, why would you want to do that? <laughs> sorry, just a bit of whimsy. Um, uh, uh, how many people have got rooms that look like this? Everybody facing a computer, everybody's back to each other, and the room left empty. I did visit uh, somewhere else recently, another council, and somebody very recently, and they showed me this wonderful training room where they press a button and these computers came out of a desk and so on. And I said to them, how much did this cost? And they went, oh, I don't know. And I said, it's probably the equivalent of my two staff members. <laughs> this, this is an interesting picture um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, you see these in schools as well still, even now although many schools are starting to get rid of their ICT suites now. Um, the argument several years ago, and it's gathering momentum, is that why do we put people into a room to do computing um, when we now all have computers in our pockets? Is this not sending a message to your learners that this is where computing is done, when in fact in the real world it's done everywhere now? That's a, that's a big problem. And there was a, a few years ago, there was a, I don't know if anyone remembers this, do you remember the Twitter hashtag pencil chat? Yeah? So basically, you take anything which has the word computer in it and you replace it with pencil, and you get some rather remarkable effects. So, for instance, um, do, we, do you now have a pencil suite in your organization? You know, do you have pencils that are chained to the desks? And um, are they multi-purpose pencils? Do they have erasers on them as well as points, you know? And do you have to learn which end is which? Uh, well, yes, you do, because it's such a complex tool now. Um, and then, um, Sorry, Steve, can I bring my, yeah, can I bring my own pencil? You, go on, but you bring your own, pen, bring bring, own, bring your own pencil with you, yeah. yeah. Or you can choose a pencil which we provide for you in the organisation. <laughs> and, and then, of course, there's the idea of mobile pencils, pencils you can take outside the organisation and take them home with you. But won't you have to worry about home insurance policies then, if, if, if it gets broken or stolen? And on it goes, and it becomes ridiculous. So really what we're doing here is, is we're, we're actually putting all our eggs in one basket saying, this is where computing is done. And ICT suites still exist. Okay, there's a microphone um, needed over here. Hi, I, I think I've sent you the link before, Steve, that that story yeah. actually goes back to 1992. Yeah. And it was called Pencils Across the Curriculum. Yeah. It was written by Bryn somebody who was an Australian. Yeah. And you think, how many years ago was 1992? <laughs> and we're now 2014. What has changed? Like I said, Absolutely. this is why we need to try and change stuff. 
like I said before, I've pulled all of my courses, classes, and workshops. I don't run any of them. I love workshops. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> workshops are wonderful because we can build loads of stuff. Who runs workshops in their organizations? Yeah, workshops are good because we have lots of stuff. We doesn't, don't do anything uh, with the stuff, but we've got loads of stuff. Doesn't the idea of workshop, the very title, put you off? Can't we not call it something else? I mean, it's you know, good. it's just a moot point, really, but, you know, I often get put off by going, you know, it's a conference, there's a workshop, well, that means I have to do something. <laughs> I'd rather just sit there and relax. You I know? guarantee you, somebody came up with that from a workshop. Really? <laughs> 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 it's, it's interesting, but I don't think it's got that much, um, well, I don't know, it's got some use, isn't it? What do you think? I found this one on the, on the web the other day, and I just thought, I've got to show that one, it's just different, you know. Um, there's something about it. Uh, the dog can see out, but the dog can't bite. You know, it can't uh, do anything else, really, except look out. Um, what's the next one? This one here is... That's called Doggles, by the way. <laughs> I really don't know how people come up with these um, ideas, but let me, tell you, let me tell you a story about um, innovation and, and change. Um, I don't know if you've heard the story about the five monkeys. A scientist who wants to find out about monkey behavior, he captures five monkeys and he puts them in a cage, locks it in. And the monkeys, as soon as they get into the cage, notice there's a ramp which takes them up to the top of the cage and hanging from the top of the cage are bananas. And so the first monkey, the strongest monkey, starts to run up the ramp. But unbeknownst to him and the other monkeys, the scientist has rigged up these cold water jets and the monkey gets sprayed with the cold water jet, and so do the other four as well. They all get drenched with cold, icy cold water. The monkey stops, runs down, and they go into a huddle again. Then another monkey tries it, and again, all the monkeys get sprayed with this icy cold jet. After a while, none of the monkeys dares go up the ramp. Then he removes a monkey and puts another monkey in that hasn't seen this scenario. And what does the monkey do? The new monkey, the new boy, he runs up the ramp and immediately gets set upon by the other four who beat the tar out of him. All right? He doesn't understand this, but he sits down and then they remove another monkey and a new monkey comes in. The same thing happens again and again until eventually there are no old monkeys in the cage anymore, just the new ones. Another new monkey comes in, starts to run up the ramp, and they all beat him up, jump on him, and he turns to them and says, why do you do that? And they said to him, we don't know, it's just the way things are done around here. <laughs> and I think the, <laughs> the story of all that is, is, is we, we, I think we've got to um, understand that as a, a culture grows within an organization, gradually parts of it become nonsensical or ritualistic, and we really don't know why we do certain things. And the whole point of disruptive innovation is to actually challenge those things and change them around and, and, um, and try and make sense of what we should be doing instead. Can I ask <coughs> a question? Sorry. I mean, I question whether it should be that black and white because even when you're saying about whether we should, you don't run any courses or any workshops and things, I mean, there's a whole auditorium full of people here who have come for something. So whether you do it or not, there's yep. obviously still a need for people to do this type of thing, and whether it's people who yeah. aren't used to social technologies and things, okay. or, you know, so does mm. one size really fit all, and can you really say that there's no, you know, requirement not for in the slightest. those methods? Not, not in the slightest, but what frustrates me is when I see people doing this. <laughs> um, painting by numbers, yeah? Everybody know what painting by numbers is? Maybe you not know what painting by numbers is. So you end up with a picture and you fill the colours in. And we do this in learning and development. One equals e-learning module. Two equals do an assessment. Three equals have it peer reviewed, etc. And what we do is we teach people how to fill in the gaps that we specify because we like over specifying. Someone comes to us and says, I want you to develop a sales program. So we find all the individual parts and we make sure that everybody has to go through all the individual bits in order to reproduce in our image what we think it looks like. What we don't do is teach people how to paint. It doesn't that have a purpose? Though? What about people who have no artistic talent whatsoever but want to paint? Isn't that a good way for them to start? It's a good way to start, but the next time we want to paint something different rather than a barn, we still give them a painting by numbers kit and another painting by numbers kit. And the problem is it's because we over-specify. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
Who, who has a banana carrier for carrying their banana to work? One person puts their hand two, up. Two in the front here. Two people, yeah, okay. Uh, why is my question. Um, Over-specifying. Who has one of these? <laughs> why do we need a, mo why do we need a motorcycle one, you? <laughs> that you can use with the steering wheel? Over-specifying. Who uses QR codes on a daily basis? Well, are they that useful? Not a single hand. Not a single hand. QR codes were going to be the new technology. The way everybody was going to do stuff. This is the best example I have ever seen of using them. Why, why do you think they failed then? Or, I, I, we're assuming they failed because no one in the room is using them, and I'm, I'm assuming we can generalise okay. that out to a larger population. Okay. Why have so, they failed? Right. What you've got here is timetables for trains. Who's right. seen the National Rail app on their phone? Use it. Yeah. Why do you need a QR code? What's happened is, is other technology came and superseded it. Maybe not from within the QR code space, but from elsewhere. So this is this superseded is, it. This is the Kodak story, the blockbuster story. All Absolutely. Over, is what you're saying. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Microphone. Who's yeah. the closest? <coughs> Sorry, just quick. That's a long time to get the microphone up. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so just very quick on the on the QR code thing. I absolutely agree. I've never seen very good use of QR codes, but um, if you pair with Bitcoin, um, because they generate very very long unique things to you, you can use a QR code for that. So it's an example of two or more technologies coming together to provide value in a way that just one of them by themselves might not be very useful. So Absolutely. And I think we will see more of that. It's bricolage. It's bringing together things from different places and putting them together. And we will see more of that. Um, but there's still a need for people to want to invent a gun that you can shoot, you know, with your head. Um, does everybody know the story of Sisyphus? Sisyphus, so Greek god, uh, punished by Zeus, um, and we do the same thing to our organisations. So Sisyphus, his job was to carry a stone up a mountain, and every time, just as he was about to put the stone at the top of the mountain, it rolls back to the bottom again. And so just as someone's about to complete the e-learning module, we say this is an assessment you need Cash to complete. Cash 22, moving the goalposts <laughs> continually. Yeah. And you go and complete the assessment. Oh, and you've now got to go on the, um, you've now got to go on the face-to-face uh, -face course. Uh, That's not face-to-face. That's, you can prepare as much as you want, yeah. but unfortunately, sometimes yeah. a ball's going to come and fly in and hit you. Yeah. Well, we're running out of time here, so we need to move on towards the end of this then. And um, I think we've got one or two key points to make about things like getting your hands dirty. What was that point, Andrew, you wanted to make there? It's just about being creative. Um, like I said, I've got no courses, classes, or workshops. It suits my organisation. Um, if you look at the platform that I use uh, for all of my learning content, it's as messy as you like. But guess what? Everybody can find the stuff they need. And it doesn't matter that it doesn't look wonderful. Um, I've got no full classrooms. My classrooms are empty. I've gone from 2,500 field course places to 1,200, 600 to zero. So I've got loads of rooms that look like this. Unfortunately, I have two and they're full. And I have um, maybe 180 students or you know, 50 students or whatever. And, and that's a big problem in higher education, um, that we're still doing this kind of traditional tiered kind of seating learning. Like, like you've got here, essentially. Um, so what we do is we try to make it more interactive, and, and I do send them off into groups, and we do give them project work and problems to solve and, and um, you know, challenging activities. And, and that's the only way around this, breaking out of that at the moment. How do we get out of the classroom, I think, is a big, big question that we need to all answer individually for whatever organisation we work with. Um, <laughs> What's that toilet golf? <laughs> I don't know what was the point with that one was. You put that one in, didn't you? Yeah. No, you so hole did. in one or something, was it? I don't know. <laughs> but um, uh, this is how people learn. Um, what's this girl listening to? Music, probably. You think so? Yeah, wasting her time listening to music. Yeah. Or what she was actually listening to was a recording from her college from the previous day. She'd missed a lecture at a college and she got a friend to record it. A friend stuck it into Dropbox. She then picked it up from Dropbox and was listening to it on her way to college the next day from where she missed it. This is how people are learning now. She came up with this idea herself with her friend. Here's a scary thought. If you take on a school leaver now, they're younger than Google. <laughs> All right, yeah. so we're saying about technology. This is how people are learning to do stuff. The big data problem, I think, is, um, is something that's going to hit all of us. The idea that you can now measure everything and that, um, uh, you know, that data, what do we use it for? What do we use them for? And, and 
uh, are, are they just for learner analytics or are there more su surveillance methods being used behind the scene? Um, there are ethical issues with this, there are technical issues, there are political issues and economic issues. And that's, I think, going to be something in the future that will disrupt more or less most of the um, L&D sector. I think the problem is we don't know what to count now. And what we end up doing is we look at big data and we come up with things like that. Someone <laughs> goes, you know what, you just won't get your face wet. That would be a good idea. Well, because nine out of ten cats don't like rain on their faces, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah? Or someone yeah. goes, that would well, be that, a good yeah. idea. Well, social learning. Social learning. That would be a good idea. It's going to save money. That would be a good idea. Just what I need. I can't, see the, point of that, so I can't see the point of that one. This is the problem we've got around big data, is we will look at it. We don't understand the data we've got now because we're measuring the wrong things. We're going back to that measuring inputs rather than measuring outcomes and output stuff. And that's the danger we've got around big data. What matters more is this stuff. Face-to-face -face conversations, people talking about doing stuff. So there is still an element of social. And we've built some social stuff into it. And there's ways that people can learn from other people. It's still going to be face-to-face. -face. This photo is the ultimate definition of irony, though. Who do you think is in that photo? Not me. No. This is a group of tin can engineers <laughs> on a night out. How much stuff did they learn on that night out? And where did they record it? Sorry. <laughs> I, think, I think this is something that um, has probably gone past its sell by date. It was, we were very excited about this about seven years ago. The MIT Six Sense, which was a projector and um, a mirror device, which you allowed, it allowed you to project your data onto any white surface, essentially. Um, but um, I used Google Glass last night for the first time. Anyone tried that yet? No? Uh, you get, go to Dave Kelly's uh, session later on. I said he's giving away them for free, but he's not, actually. He's got one set that he'll show you. And I, I was allowed to use it last night, and um, I was amazed at how quickly I could use it and how quickly you got used to the fact that something was up in the top of your right eye, and you could look, look, look at it, but you could also look through and see your surroundings. So I, I think there are, there are ways that we're going to augment our reality in the future. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the very near future, like the next two years, which will also be disruptive in organisations. And um, finally... This picture, uh, some of you might recognize some of the people in it. Um, we put this together as the final image of this presentation um, to give you a message, really, and you've got to go and figure what it is. Um, thank you very much. Well, I know you've been um, um, talking a lot but do you have any sort of further points to add to this argument to see which one of them argues about it? We appreciate that's a random set of images and a seemingly random conversation. However, has anything that we've spoken about made you think, could I do something differently? So hand over there. Hand over there. Don't drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> it was your image of the um, girl listening to her college lecture and this idea that normally the, the e-learning that we put out as organisations has to be this really high quality um, product that is going to stay around for ages. But currently, you know, our philosophy and feeling is that things can actually be quick and dirty, talking yep. about being a maverick, you know, we do tend to just record sessions where we've got people in and talk to them and we will put them up and use them. And some people really like it because if they weren't there, they could do it. Whereas other people are, oh, well, it doesn't hit the quality, you know, that is normally expected. So I just wanted to sort of have some thoughts about that sort of throwaway learning versus, you know, real sort of top draw okay. learning. Um, so somebody comes to me and says they want to learn about time management. Can I go on a course? No, you can't because we don't have any. What I would do is I would pair you up with somebody or help you find somebody who could help you with it. Or I would say, go and have a look in a forum and see if someone's built some content in there that's going to help you. Or go and have a look at this content and go and look and see what's available. So look at peer-to-peer. -peer. And if you find a checklist and a way of doing something, upload it and share it to other people. It's not going to be perfect, but it's not my job to manage it. It's not my job to create that stuff because physically I haven't got the resource and I haven't got the time. I have a whole organisation of people, though, who can do that. So why don't I trust them to do it? And all I do is then dip in and quality assure as required. At the front here. 
It, it's like the YouTube example, isn't it? I, I saw a quote the other day that the most used search engine is Google. The second most used is YouTube. You can go onto YouTube and find everything yep. about everything. Yep. Yep. And it's not high quality, but it does the job. Yep. Well, as Don Clark said in a blog post recently, I think it was Don Clark said it. He's here somewhere. Is he in the audience? Probably next door somewhere. But Don Clark actually said that um, Google, sorry, um, that YouTube is no longer just social media. It's now a platform because there's so much you can do with it. There's a creative element. There's tools that you can use within it. And ultimately, yes, it is. It's the repository of everything, isn't it? Um, it goes back to Tim Berners-Lee's original idea of, you know, inquire in everything within, you know. Um, so, so really, we, we have a, now a wealth of, of, of content. Trouble with YouTube is most of it's rubbish. Uh, <laughs> so how do we sift through the rubbish and find the good stuff? That, so it's now about aggregating and, and curating and about filtering and about all of the new skills that um, our learners need to acquire, and we need to acquire yeah. as well, what but we call the digital literacies. But again, I don't think that's a job for learning and development. What no, that I don't. Is, is that's a job for, so for example, risk management. I'll go to my risk manager mm -hmm. and I'll say, you need to put some content together, you need to support it. What's the right stuff that's there? And help them to find the stuff that's relevant and appropriate. So use your subject matter experts to curate the activity for you. What that means is me, from a learning development perspective, is literally to go in and just quality assure the stuff that's going on and making sure that they're doing the things that are right. If people are using it, then that's a good thing. My organisation's got about 2,800 staff, and I get between six and 800 staff on a monthly basis will enrol on something new. So that's a third of my organisation every month learning something new. So we have two Jeez. here. One, one, Leslie first, I think. Put her hand up. I'm going to go back and say this is all old hat again. Um, I've probably been doing this job far too bloody long. <laughs> back in, uh, in, I think it was 1999, when I was a uh, learning manager in a, an FE college, we used something called InfoTrack. And InfoTrack used to have, used to, it was like a, a search engine type curating um, facility where you would do a search, it would save, it would look at all the articles for you on that search, it would save the search, you would give that link to your, your learners, your students, and you would know that that, the, that resource had been quality assured so that they weren't looking for a needle in a haystack. We're talking 14, 15 years ago. Why is there not something like that now? Good question. Good question. I think that would actually be really, really useful. Mm. Come pitch it to one of the vendors downstairs and see <laughs> what they say. <laughs> and in the front here, there was another question or a comment. It'll be the last one. It's the last one, is it? We're running out of time. It's, um, right. Oh, um, oh, 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 all right. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Right, okay. Too Go. many fighting for the mic here. Um, I just thought I'd share an experience I had working with Edinburgh University um, and their architectural students. Um, we um, helped them um, expand on what they, which what was already happening in the studio, in the architectural studio. Because when you wor work with architecture uh, and you're actually physically building the models for the ideas that you have, you create it, you scrap it, you find out what works and what gravity doesn't allow you to do, um, and you evolve on your ideas side by side with your peers. Um, and the other thing is that you, the teachers uh, analysing the work will will give you the critiques um, in the full view and in the shot of the other students, which means you can actually learn from students that are doing better than you, that have completely different ideas, and you will still get the value from the feedback from them, and you can start building in that peer-to-peer -peer community physically. And then we were um, kind of, to me, that always stood out as kind of the ideal. If we can get that happening online, you know, in a community like that. that yeah, the I think that line, should be the goal. Yeah, the bottom line there is that um, peer re feedback and expert feedback are both equally important exactly. for learning. In terms of the technologists and the te learning, learning technologists within organisations, you were saying that you know, we need to go and use our subject matter experts to really provide the content side of things. But if we were to be the championing of, of new technologies and the, and the rate in which technology is changing and the, and the rate at which new things are coming out, how do we distinguish between the QR codes, which we sometimes become faddish and are here short term and don't still have 
the purpose or serve a purpose for, for a very length of time too, to something that is going to have sort of a, a really strong hold within an organisation that the, the business users can actually really benefit and, and actually serve a purpose. So yeah. how, how do we actually use our skills to be able to trawl through some of the, the yeah. sometimes it feels like mud, um, yeah. to actually find the things that are actually going to really add value and add, yeah. add purpose. We used to use the, the four factors that limit innovation to your advantage. One, hierarchy. So who are the people who are saying things have to be done that way? What are the things that they suggest and how they should be done? If we're looking temporally, so what have we tried in the past? Well, what technology have we got that we still need to develop and use? Laterally, well, what are other people doing? So develop your networks of people who can help you. Um, lateral, temporal, physical. Yeah, what space have you got? So what technology exists already? What, how are you using and what could you extend and use more of? And how could you develop it? Happy to have a conversation with you afterwards about it, about how we plan this stuff. Great. There we go. It's tea time. Big round of applause for Steve Wheeler, Andrew Jacobs. <laughs>